splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. Lift it up. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And will see how great, how great is our God.
Good morning. If you've uh, forgotten to pick up the emblems on the way in, the table's back here. Um, I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 45. The Bible says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. This is a time when Jesus is hanging upon the cross. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to, to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. 
And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. You know, since the day that Jesus began his ministry, there were many people who did not believe that he was the Christ, the Son of God. The centurion and those that were with him didn't believe that it was the Son of God until they witnessed the earthquake and all those things that took place at his death. Even today, in a court of law, having eyewitness testimony is the most powerful testimony that you can have. Men are condemned or set free based on eyewitness testimony. And back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul provides a list of the eyewitnesses to the resurrection that included uh, Cephas, the twelve, over 500 at one time, James, and lastly to Paul. Besides all these witnesses, there's over 300 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by the coming of Christ. But still, many deny. As we partake of the emblems, not only are we remembering the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior who was nailed to the cross, who sacrificed himself for our sins, but we also remembering that he is the re resurrected Son of God and that salvation is only possible through him. We are affirming that he is alive and that he will return for his church. And for those of us that are Christians, we'll return to him to live eternally in a new heaven and a new earth. That's quite a promise. And it's the reason that we're here this morning. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we do lift up your holy name. We bow before your throne. We are in all of you, in all of your creation. And Father, we are so appreciative, appreciative of the fact that Jesus loved us enough to die upon the cross willingly that we might have forgiveness of sins, that we might walk on this earth clean and holy because of what he did for us, and that we might also look forward to a new heaven, a new earth, new bodies eternally with you. So, Father, as we partake of these emblems, let us remember as we partake of the, of the bread, remember his body that was nailed to the cross for us, and as we partake of the blood, his blood that was shed for the forgiveness that we receive. So, Father, we love you, we praise you, and we pray these things in his name. Amen.
Well, good morning, church. Good to see you today. So grateful that each and every one of you are here this week. We've had a wonderful opportunity to worship in song, now to worship through the study of His Word and try to better understand and apply that for ourselves. Over the last few weeks, we've been going through a series I've just called Fundamentals. It's the basics of what we believe as a church as it relates to our relationship with God, who the Son Jesus Christ is, how we get into Christ, the practice of the Lord's Supper. We had a wonderful time of fellowship last week in that. And this week, one of the fundamentals that has really developed over the last few years for us is the importance of community within the Lord's church, our journey together. Uh, The good news about our faith is while we might, what some would label, have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, ultimately our relationship with Jesus Christ isn't private, but we have the opportunity to share that with other people. And other people have the opportunity to come alongside of us and encourage us in that way. The uh, main idea for today is that the growth of the church is rooted in small groups. About five years ago, we identified a need in this congregation, and we developed it over the course of the next two years then and introduced small groups where individuals within the church would come together throughout the week to build relationships, to study the Bible, to grow in their faith together and just have a community of believers that were like-minded with them that they could relate to through the week. It's so important that we have that. It's wonderful that we can come together here on a Sunday morning and, and share in song and, and hear preaching and share in the Lord's Supper. All of those things are so vital for the growth of our personal faith and for us corporately. But it's these individual relationships that are built in small group settings that really I've discovered personally, and I know many of you have as well, are transformative in our faith, that take us to the next level of our faith. Today we're going to look in Acts chapter 2, and I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the first church. On the day of Pentecost, it was a celebration day for uh, the Old Testament people of Israel. They'd come together around the temple. They had this opportunity to hear for the very first time the preaching of the gospel. And the Bible tells us that Peter and the rest of the apostles preached to the gathered crowd. And on that day, 3,000 souls were added to the Lord's church. They were baptized into Christ, and they became a part of the Lord's church. It's interesting to me, especially in communities like you and I live in here in eastern Knox County, Knox County, small communities, we're not into big groups by and large. We like the idea of a small group. But the first church was a mega church. 3,000 souls were added on that day. And so the question from a leadership perspective is this. How do you disciple 3,000 people when you just have 12 leaders, apostles? How do you shepherd those people? How do those people serve and learn to serve other individuals? How do we train them in the way that God has called us to train them? And I think we have a great illustration where just on the the start of football season here in our county. And when we look at a football team, you've got, depending on which school you're at, dozens of football players. How can one coach train and lead all of those football players? He's got coordinators that work under him. He's got an offensive coordinator. He's got a defensive coordinator. But even beyond that, a football team is going to have a coach specifically geared toward quarterbacks, and the linemen towards special teams. And so when we think about an organization, which in part the church is, it has to be broken down into subgroups, just like a football team would be, if you want to be fruitful in the ministry that God has given us. And so as we look at Acts chapter 2 today, I want us to discover how the first church did it and how we're trying to repeat it now 2,000 years later. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we give you praise. You're an awesome God, and we know, Father, that only through you do we experience the blessings of life, not just life now, but life for eternity, and we look forward to that. And Father, we're grateful to be a part of a church family here, part of a church family, Lord, that has, Father, honored you to the best of our ability in what we teach and in what we do. And Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart will be will will please you today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we come into Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 42. And the Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching 
and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So in Acts 2.42, we discover the four essential things that this church devoted themselves to. The apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching. Uh, The scriptures had not yet been written in the way that we have them today. Isn't it a blessing to have the book of God, the word of God in collected form? Well, it was in the process of being written in the first century. And so they didn't have Bibles that they could hand out to people when they got baptized. They couldn't go to the store and buy a Bible. They had to rely upon what the apostles taught them. Next, excuse me, in two weeks, we're going to look at the second part of this passage here where it says many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. But that's what was going on in the first century. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Jesus had ascended into heaven, and he had left the apostles behind so that they might have the opportunity to teach the church moving forward. God did not abandon us. Instead, he gave us the indwelling gift of his spirit that equips us for holy living, and he gave us apostles and leaders in the Lord's church to train us into works of service. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, doctrine to fellowship fellowship in the church has become a meal. In fact, a lot of times people just simply say, let's have a fellowship meal. And while food is a big part of fellowship, not just in the church, but anywhere, if you really want to get to know somebody and you want to meet up with them the first time, oftentimes you'll do it over a cup of coffee or over a meal. And there's just something about coffee and food that seem to break down barriers between people. And so fellowship, while it may include food, is not definitively food. Fellowship essentially means this, the sharing of themselves with one another. And that's what we'll talk about today. They devoted themselves to a third thing, the the breaking of bread. This is the Lord's Supper, the communion that we talked about last week, and then to prayers. They were devoted, devoted to these four things. They found it essential to be invested in the Lord's church in those ways. Let's jump ahead look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And so here we have this church. Thousands of people had gathered, crammed themselves into the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Many of them had traveled from afar to celebrate this day of Pentecost. And so some of them, when they became Christians, they didn't go back home. They settled in. They hankered down. They, they remained in Jerusalem so that they could be equipped for the work of the Lord's church. They were new in their faith, and they surrounded themselves by God's people. So they had all things in common, and they shared with each other whatever the other people might have had need for. And then verses 46 and 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So back in that day, they didn't have church buildings like we have today. The church would gather together in the temple for worship. But they would also gather in the temple area as everybody else in their culture did. It was a, it was a social center of the city. There were different courts There were different marketplaces outside and around the walls of the temple. And this is where the people would have worked and fellowshiped and spent time together. It was the social center of their lives. It says they were also breaking bread in their homes day by day. Now there's a difference between the breaking of bread here in this verse and the breaking of bread mentioned in verse 42. In verse 42, there's a definite article there, the, the breaking of bread. That that in the New Testament scriptures refers to the Lord's Supper. But in a general sense, just like you and I might have supper tonight at 5 or 6 o'clock tonight, they would also eat the regular meals. And they shared their meals together with each other in their homes. They were building relationships. They were creating a structure within the Lord's church that allowed their faith to be nurtured, for them to have friendships, to have their needs provided for, and for them to grow up in their faith. And so growth happens in the Lord's church Ideally, in small groups. The first way this happens is in missional growth. We're going to start at the bottom of this text and work our way up. In Acts 2.47, it says, The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So as these 
Christians were interacting with one another as they were going about their business, some of them getting jobs and some, some of them just caring for other people, learning and growing in their faith, the church began to grow and to flourish. A little bit later in the book of Acts, we learned that it had grown to at least 5,000. So the church in Jerusalem continued to grow and grow and grow until eventually it began to spread throughout the Roman world at that time. And it says the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, as a congregation, we've grown significantly in the past eight months. Last year, we averaged just over 200 people. This year, we're averaging 250 people. Since Father's Day of this year, we're averaging 270 people. We keep growing and growing and growing. On Father's Day, surprising to me, not Mother's Day or Easter, we had 300 people for the very first time in this building. Good thing we have 400 chairs in this room. There's plenty of room for people. But the church has continued to grow. And, and we could try to break down scientifically how this happens. We could try to look at the corporate identity of the church and the different leadership aspects, the different programs and activities we have in this church. And we could say the church is growing because of these different things. But I'll be honest with you. I have no idea why it's growing other than God. Other than God. And all glory needs to go to God. Now, there's been a lot of changes in our community. As, as our culture has changed and people have become more transient, smaller churches in small communities have seemed to be fading away. And people are generally coming together in larger groups like we have here on a Sunday morning. The goal of a church setting like this, to have as many people as we possibly can here on a Sunday morning, it isn't to glorify what we're doing as a church. It's to glorify God and to let as many people as possible have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ as possible. It's what it's all about. I hope that there's one thing you've learned in my preaching over time. It's not about me. It's not about this church. It is about Jesus. Everything is always about Jesus. And we want to center everything we do in the word of God. And when we stop doing that, let us know because we're in trouble. And we need to make some changes if that ever happens. So success is not in the total number of people. But I would say this. We see victories in the individual salvations that are occurring here. We had a young lady earlier this week who came and heard the gospel preached in its fullness for the first time. And she called and she said, I need to be baptized. And so we baptized her into Christ on Tuesday. That's what should be happening in the Lord's church. Because the Lord is adding to his church day by day those are being saved not just in the activities of a Sunday morning, but every day in the life of the church, people's lives are being changed. Now, let me say this. I think a bigger church, and I'm talking about the size of the people that attend, is a very beneficial thing. It allows us opportunities to fund mission work like we never did before. It allows us opportunities to provide uh, services for people like we've never been able to do before. It allows us to have different activities and venues where people can learn and grow in their faith like we never have had before. And so there's a lot of benefits in having a large congregation. But I would say this. One of the downsides of having a larger congregation is it's easy to hide. It's easy to show up on a Sunday morning and maybe shake a hand or two on your way, way out and maybe shake a hand or two on, uh, as you depart. But it's easy to hide. It's easy to come in and never build relationships with any other Christians. It's easy to come in and think that your relationship with God is only defined by yourself. But God never intended relationships with him to be defined on an individual basis, rather in community with other people. And so what we have seen as we have continued to grow is God is adding to his church day by day those who are being saved. Now, I will say this. We try and have done some things that I think have, have helped us to, to foster that growth. And journey groups have been a big part of that for us. And out of that have even come different study groups. And we'll look at those in a moment. But we are fulfilling the goal that Zach and the youth group set out for this church at the beginning of this year. And we've sort of piggybacked on. We want to have an impact for Jesus in our world. And Christians, you are having an impact on our world for Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. But that comes with a mindset. 
having this missional mindset that we want to go out and reach people. And the people that come in, we want to reach them for Jesus. That is a mindset. It is an attitude toward the world that is around us. Recently, some of you guys may be familiar with this. I had a fella come to me a few weeks ago. He said, hey, have you, you heard this new song by this singer uh, named Oliver Anthony? At the time, I'd never heard of it. But that week, that's all I heard. It was all over the place, this song by this young man who goes by the name Oliver Anthony. It's called Rich Men, North of Richmond, Virginia. Think of your geography and think of the people that live north of Richmond in D.C. This song that this guy sang is just resonating literally with millions of people. It was number one on the charts in all classifications of music in the past couple of weeks. One line that he has in this song, I think, resonates with a lot of us here. We're just old souls in a new world. And we don't fully understand how we're to relate with the world in which we live and and all of the changes that are going on with it. Now, I'll I'll give you a caution on language. The dude has a, a foul mouth a couple times. But his language, I think, comes out of frustration with the society in which we're living today. He's addressing issues relating to our society to our economy, and ultimately blaming the corrupt politicians, the rich men north of Richmond. And so when we think of songs and politicians that seem to just drive to the heart of the frustration that many of us are facing, we think that maybe there's an answer there for us. I want to share with you what this Oliver Anthony said about himself and where that song came from. I'd play it for you, but we're in church. (laughs) But listen to what he says, because I think it's very insightful. Very insightful. There's nothing special about me. I'm not a good musician. I'm not a very good person. I've spent the last five years struggling with mental health health, and using alcohol to drown it out. I'm sad to see the world in the state that it's in, with everyone fighting with each other. I've spent many nights feeling hopeless, that the greatest country on earth is quickly fading away. I have a sense in some of what he said that we could echo an amen, that we could say, yeah, we too are frustrated with that. But what he reveals to us is very insightful about the soul of America today, that this kid has a lot of right answers as it relates to the economy and to politics. And in his frustration, it drove him to alcohol and despondency, and depression. And so what this guy teaches me through his song and through his words and his life is that getting a new set of politicians, lowering our taxes, and stopping welfare abuse will not solve the deeper issues of this new world that we old souls live in. Identifying problems will not solve those problems. Uniting Americans under the banner of conservatism will not solve those problems. Church, our responsibility is to unite people under the banner of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who solves those problems. And here's one area I personally would like to see us grow in as a church. It's just sort of an aside as far as something that I'm not sure the answer in, but I see that we're doing it in an effective way at a certain level right now, but, but we've got to grow in this area. I want to see us reach more and more young men like Oliver Anthony. I want to fill the rest of these seats with young men that are frustrated with the world in which they live, that are going home every night and drinking alcohol and going to bed every night depressed and wondering if they even want to wake up in the morning. I want to fill this church building with young men and young women like that because alcohol is not their answer. He proved that. Fixing the economy and getting rid of the politicians is not the answer. We've tried that for decades. Writing a song about your feelings isn't the answer to any problems that we're solving. What he needs is Jesus Christ. And he may read a scripture at a concert, but his life is not changed by Jesus. Because in that song, there is no hope. And young men like him, and young women, these old souls that are living in this new world and not quite sure how to deal with it, they need to be here hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeing their hearts and their lives transformed and on their way to heaven with the rest of us. Amen? 
And so I'm not sure the answer in reaching those young guys, but we better start doing it because it's those young guys that are starting to lead in our culture. And they're the ones that are going to be representatives and senators and presidents and school board members. They're the ones that are going to be teaching our children. And I don't want my kids to learn that the answer to solving your problems is getting drunk at night and writing a song about it. But the answer is in Christ and in Christ alone. And I will tell you this. I did one just a couple of weeks ago. I've done way too many funerals. Way too many funerals in nearly 20 years of ministry for young men in particular that have given their lives over to alcohol and depression. They think the answer is partying. But that partying just leaves the pain in the morning and despondency at night. So we do live in a new world, don't we, church? The things that used to work, they don't work. Even in the church, we are growing in our understanding of that. There used to be a time where the work of a church about this size could be centered in one or two men, maybe a few women doing ministry as well. What I'm discovering is that people don't want want me in their houses like they used to. I can't go into individual homes and study the Bible like we used to. A lot of people don't have any sort of grounding in the Scriptures, and so that has caused us to say, how do we reach more and more people as possible, as many people as we possibly can? You know, winning the world for Jesus may have involved once in a lifetime, and it probably still works somewhere in some way. Winning the world for Jesus doesn't work knocking on doors. What do you do when they show up at your house knocking on doors, trying to give you their literature? You hide. Giving a gospel presentation in a living room. Sharing the importance of being baptized into Christ. When I start speaking language like that with people that have no grounding in the Scriptures, they're lost. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Why? Because the answer is not in baptism. Baptism ultimately is the solution, certainly, to becoming a Christian. But we need to give people hope in Jesus Christ. We need to point them to the cross. And so I'm convinced that Acts 2 kind of growth happens in an Acts 2 kind of way. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved because they were together in the temple courts and eating with one another from house to house. People with common needs and common hurts need one another. We do a lot of great things here. We do a lot of great things here. I'm not being boastful. I just think God's doing some good stuff through the things that we do here. One of the greatest things that we've done here over the past eight years is grief share. I mean, yeah, it's been great to to have a forum in which people in a small group setting can come in and and talk about the challenges of dealing with a lost one. I highly, highly recommend it. Our new group starts here in just another um, few days. But the goal of Grief Share is not to help people fix their grief. The goal of Grief Share is to bring people to Jesus. And we've seen over the past few years all kinds of people being brought to Jesus because they needed help with their grief. I'm just looking out here, and I see uh, one couple that came to Grief Share who brought another couple to Grief Share, and that couple brought somebody else to church, and now all of them are in Christ, serving the Lord faithfully here alongside of us. And so this small group mentality, as we journey together with one another, it should result in missional growth. It should result with us saying, I'm not just here because I want to be your friend. I'm here because I know the Savior, and I want you to know Him too. And we want to point people to Christ the best we can. And so it's in these types of groups that we see growth. Not just missional growth, reaching people for Jesus Christ, but, but relational growth, relational growth growth. In Acts 2.44, it says all who believed were together and had all things in common. I hope you've gained an understanding in any sort of involvement you've had in this church, that church is more than just preaching and singing. We're not here to entertain you. We're not here to draw in the masses so that people have something to do on a Sunday morning. You've got other things you could be doing, I'm sure. Our goal is to be here and to live in a community that that God intended us to live in. 
And I'm not talking about the community of Eastern Knox County or wherever you may live. I'm talking about the community of believers that, by, that God points to as being a, a body with Christ at the head. A building being built together for the glory of God. The idea of community in the context of the church is for us to be together, growing together, building our own relationships with others. So groups allow us to know each other, to love each other, to pray for each other, to laugh with each other, and to cry with each other at times. And so our small groups, journey groups, study groups, whatever structure we might have, they're designed to connect people together. And so I would invite you after the service to stop at the back table here. Jeff will be back there. And we've got sign-ups for journey groups and our study groups today. Let me challenge you in this way. We have a couple groups that are already full, and there's not a sign-up sheet for them. So don't create one if you want to be in Randy and Joanne's group or Dave and Marlene's group. They're already full, okay? What we want you to do is spread your wings a little bit. Maybe try to get in a group where your mom's not in if you're an adult child. Maybe get into a group where your best friends aren't leading it. But get into a group where you can invest in the lives of other Christians, where you can find people that will have your back as you walk this journey of faith. You know, in the, in the New Testament, there's over 30 times that God has told us to take care of one another in a variety of, of ways. We can't do it collectively in a room like this. If I were to take a survey, let's just be honest, 75% of us don't know 75% of us. And, and that didn't just happen this summer. That happened a long time ago. When we were still at the old building, when we were gathering together in that old worship center down there, we still didn't really know each other. And you may shake hands with somebody every week. You may share a cup of coffee with them here between Sunday school and the service. You may look at the back of their head every week as I preach. But let's just be honest, you don't really know those people. And I know for a lot of us, we've got family in the area. And so we've got family that will help us and guide us and be a part of our lives throughout the week. But a lot of us don't necessarily have families that are on the same page as we are spiritually. And we need other Christians to walk alongside of us. Your children need other Christians to be walking alongside of them. We don't call it a journey group, but my, oh my, the youth group, these kids are connected at the hip. They love each other. They care for each other. They share life with each other, not just at 7 o'clock on Sunday night, but all the time. If your young person isn't involved in journey group, I will say, or in youth group, my guess is they're not growing spiritually, and that's on you. I'll just be honest with you there. They need to be involved just like you need to be involved with that as well. And so journey groups have simply become a time and a place where the one another's of the New Testament can be lived out. You know, we chase so much in the world. Right now, schools have just started, so a lot of kids are hopefully focused on academics. Uh, sports are just underway in our, in our schools, and I know that's important and, and brings us together for a lot of different things, and that's good. But I want you to listen for a moment hopefully the guys have this cued for us here, to a guy named Kyle Martin. He was the high school valedictorian of his school a couple of years ago, and he had incredible wisdom for an 18-year-old. For you tonight as the 2019 valedictorian, this time last year, I found out that I was in the running for this title. It was then that I decided I wanted it. So I worked hard for it. I sacrificed for it. And yes, I stressed for it. <laughs> and I got it. <laughs> and at our senior award ceremony, it felt so good when I heard my name announced with this title. It was so good. For about 15 seconds. Yeah, 15 seconds of my heart racing and my adrenaline pumping. 15 seconds of, yeah, I won. 15 seconds of being at the top of the pile of all my accomplishments, and it felt euphoric. But there must come a 16th second. And on that 16th second, I sat down in my seat, I looked at my silver stole that says valedictorian, and I thought, that's it? <laughs> what just happened? Why, why am I not feeling anything else? 
to be honest, I, I don't even know what I was expecting. A parade of balloons to drop? Or, or maybe I was hoping that all of my problems would fade away in comparison to this amazing achievement. But none of that happened, not even in my heart. I felt nothing. I was shocked. This was a huge problem for me, and I needed to figure out why. So here was my thought process. Working hard is good, but it should not be done for the sole purpose of a goal sake at the expense of relationship with others. And looking back on this year, I realized that the stress of this year for this goal in a five minute speech was paid for with the lack of attending to relationships in my life. A lesson learned and self-reflection accomplished. Now, I would like you, my fellow classmates, to do some self-reflecting. I would like you to take a moment to fill in a different thing that you strive for and you focused on. Something that you thought was the end all be all. Perhaps it was sports, perhaps it was fine arts, academics, getting into a particular school, an unhealthy social life. Friends, we are about to launch into life and we haven't messed anything up yet. <laughs> now think, instead of academics taking your focus off your important relationships, it was your career you chose over your spouse. Instead of sports, it's money that you pursue at the detriment of your children. Instead of just the Instagram-worthy picture, it's striving to be famous at the expense of time with your friends because now you're too self-involved. I'm well aware that this is kind of a downer speech, but I don't care. <laughs> because a lesson learned should be a lesson shared. Now, I'm glad that I have only made this mistake of striving for something that is in the light of eternity not important for just one year. I can't imagine if I had learned this at 50 or at the end of my life. And here's the lesson. Have no regrets in the 16th second. Second of life. And we're looking back and counting all the regrets, the things we pursued at the loss of our families, at the loss of close friends, the loss of a relationship with Jesus Christ and his people. The 16th second is what matters. Lots of people are living beyond that 16th second, though, in this church. Isn't that good? They are. They, they understand that relationships are vital for their own spiritual growth and for the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I, I mentioned the community that exists within our youth group here. I look at the community that, that exists within our young adults, all these young families that are bonded together through Christ. I look at so many of the families in this congregation that are bonded together in Christ. I look at our experience over the past four or five years with small groups, and I see new people bonded in Christ because they're bonded with one another. You are not meant to walk through life alone, and you're not meant to walk through your faith alone either. Friends, we are going to spend eternity with everybody else that's a Christian. Get to know them now. You cannot do it on your own. And I can't read your heart, and I don't know your mind. But I have enough experience with enough people to know this. The people that are growing in their faith and that are vibrantly serving God in their lives are deeply involved in the lives of other Christians also. Those are the people that are growing in their faith. In the old days, the mindset of the church would have been this, come in and believe, and then be baptized, and then you can belong. I've discovered this more and more. As a church, we better be inviting people to come in and belong, because when they belong, we're able to open the door to their soul and help them understand the importance of belief in Jesus Christ so they can get baptized and begin living their lives for him. And that's the beauty of our groups here, our journey groups and our study groups are full of Christians that have been serving God faithfully for years, but they also have people that are brand new in their faith and people that aren't even Christians, people that are just brand new to the church and discovering what all this church stuff is about. They're belonging and we're helping them to believe and become what God wants them to be in him. And so we've got nine journey groups in this church. 
A few of them are, are just snacks, a devotion, time of prayer, and, and conversation. A couple of them are like, they're like going to a banquet every week. You don't have to have a banquet. You can just have snacks. You don't even need to have snacks. You just need to grow in your relationships with one another. We're introducing one group this year, and this is, don't sign up if you like to just go on walks. Sign up if you like to hike. If you like to work in your hiking, sign up for Zach and Emily's group. We've got a new group that they're starting that's focused on that interest of being outside and pressing the limits of your physical abilities. Maybe not that bad. But more importantly, connecting with one another, growing in their faith, and exploring Jesus and his world together. I love the story. I won't say their names. I don't want to embarrass them, but we've got a couple. Both of them were just baptized into Christ in the past few months. Long before they were baptized into Christ, they were in a journey group building relationships with people that help them understand what being a Christian really is all about. And when that fellow had to go through surgery, the preacher was there, the elders were there for him, but his journey group was there for him too. That's life in the Lord's church. That's what it is about. And the problem is when you go through your life as a Christian and you never connect to anybody else deeply, and you go through those moments where you have surgery or your spouse is suffering or your spouse passes away, a lot of times you're just there alone trying to process it all. Wouldn't it be better if you had a family of Christians that surrounded you with the love and support that you need? Journey groups should be places where we are known so well that we can't hide who we really are. We can't pretend to be somebody else. People get to know the real you and the real me. But if you just want to hide and come to church when it's real busy and full of people, you do that, but you're not going to grow in your faith. And you'll never be a blessing to other people, and you have so much to offer the rest of the church. And so this relational growth, 100%, in the context of the Lord's church, leads to spiritual growth as well. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and following, day by day, they were attending the temple together. They were in the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. And so worship, worship and learning can happen in rows, but true discipleship happens in circles. You can come here together and corporately worship. We can corporately take the Lord's Supper. We can learn and grow intellectually in our faith. But true growth is going to happen in the living rooms of the members of this church. True, gro true growth may happen in this room, but it's going to happen in the coffee shops where you're studying the Bible with somebody else. And so besides journey groups, if you want to dig a little bit deeper, I would encourage you to look into a study group. We've got a whole bunch of those as well. Wednesday nights, we meet together and do a corporate study. Sunday school classes, that's a great way to learn and grow in your faith. Sunday evenings, if you're interested in knowing what the Bible has to say about divorce, remarriage, tonight's the night. Be here. That's when you're learning and you're growing. Some of our study groups will go through books of the Bible together. They use other study helps. They use books. They use videos. Our, our ladies group, I think, was our first formal study group. The Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock ladies group, it's going to kick off again September 5th. These ladies have filled that fellowship hall table with sometimes 20 or more women studying the scriptures, growing in their faith, and encouraging one another as they go along the way. We've got groups on Monday night for young ladies. We've got a Tuesday morning uh, group for men that meets in Danville. We've got Thursday groups that meet here at the church building. It's not merely, though, about knowing the Bible. These groups will help you to apply the Bible, to, to take what you're hearing on a Sunday morning or what you're reading in God's Word and put it into life each and every day. And besides just knowing the Bible, you get to know people and build friendships and build accountability. Church, Acts 2 was a mega church, 3,000 people. And I want to be like that church. Not numerically, I could care less if we ever have 3,000 people. I mean, my life gets really hard the more people we get, okay? But I do want as many people to hear the gospel as possible in Eastern Knox County. And I, I know that I, I'm partnered with a, 
couple hundred people that are on that same mission as I am to make an impact on the world for Jesus Christ. But we've got to make sure that we're making an impact on each other's lives. And while Acts 2 tells us what that church did, Hebrews 3 tells us how they did it. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, it says, Take care lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort or encourage one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. You've got to have people in your life if you want to be growing in your faith. The church is composed of the people that need to be in your life that are encouraging you and exhorting you throughout the week so that you're not hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. So my question is this, who's looking out for you? Who is looking out for you? Who are you looking out for? Who has your back? Because to be a part of the family of God, you need people looking out for you and people for whom you're looking out as well. It's not merely that we're called to be loved, but that we're called to be long. And it's my prayer today that each and every one of us will have a commitment to understand the growth of the church is rooted in small groups. And you'll take that step today to join them. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we praise you. We thank you for the truth of your word and the opportunity we have, Lord, to be here today, to grow, to learn, to study. And I pray, God, that each and every one of us will take opportunities each day to build our relationships with others that we might grow in our relationship with you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, perhaps you're here and you want to belong to this church. You like what's going on. You like what you've heard over the last six weeks about what we believe and what, what we do. You've been baptized into Jesus Christ, perhaps at a different congregation, and you're walking faithfully for the Lord, and you want to start walking with us here for him. We invite you, if you've talked to our elders, had a conversation with them about what church membership is, we invite you to come forward and place your membership with us. But if you're not a Christian, if all of this stuff I'm talking about is like algebra to a third grader, you don't really understand all of this, we want to help you to understand what the Bible says about your soul, about your future, and about your life today. And if you need that kind of help, we're here for you. We'll guide you. See me afterwards. See one of the men out in the foyer. But if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you've repented and you've made the decision to start walking for Him, and you're ready to be baptized into Christ, you come up and we'll help you do that as we stand and sing this song of invitation. This is Denny and Jennifer Snow. Denny and Jennifer were baptized at Millwood years ago, and uh, they've been at the Central Church in Mount Vernon. They want to place their membership here with us in Millwood. And so, Denny, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. And Jennifer, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. All right, let's repeat that together. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> repeat this after me. I believe... That Jesus, is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The of the living God. Amen. Amen. They're sitting right up here, so make sure after the service, right next to his mom and dad who are crying right now, you guys can go up there and sit down. Make sure you have a chance, if you haven't gotten to know them yet, to do that. Introduce yourself as we continue to sing. No, come to Hide your grip. 
church. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. And uh, just to clarify a few things as far as announcements go. Uh, if you want to be in our journey group and you want to do some hiking and some kayaking, that sort of thing, but you don't know if you can quite complete the whole thing, Emily personally volunteered to carry anyone who can't finish the hike. Um, yeah. Uh, but I just want to encourage you to sign up for the journey groups in the back and uh, get to know some people that maybe you don't know as well as you think and uh, uh, see if you can start to build some of those relationships. also want to remind you, September 7th at 630, Grief Share will start. If you have any questions, you can see Joe Thomas or Ernie Kaufman. And then September 9th, there's going to be the annual Wakatomica golf outing, as well as the hot dog roast later in the evening. You can still sign up for that in the back. September 10th, we're going to have a community meditation class for uh, the guys that uh, would have gotten something in their folder. If you're interested in that, come to that class in the back, and uh, we'll just do some refreshers and hopefully um, help one another. And then uh, Mike Bratton is coming home today. So that's a great thing. Uh, he had open heart surgery. So uh, if you can continue to keep him in your prayers. And then with other good news, uh, we want to welcome now the Snows who have placed their membership. Jane Gentry, who was baptized late, uh, earlier this week, as well as Brianna Dawson, who placed her membership with us. Oh, and Keaton is home from the military. Um, so we've been praying for him for the last few years. So we're glad to have him with us. So if you would, bow with us, and we'll close in prayer. Our Father, we turn in heaven. We thank you for just allowing us to be able to be here to praise you. And we pray that uh, we can take your word out to the world with us. God, I pray and ask you to watch over and guide each and every one of us as we travel through this week. In Jesus' name we pray.